What's good, folks, and welcome to the Cover One Film Room. I am one of your two hosts this evening, Anthony Prohaska, joined, as always, by Eric Turner. And Eric, the offseason provides us the opportunity to dive into a lot of different avenues here on the film room. You know, once once the regular season and playoffs end, we start diving into, you know, season analysis and recap pieces, looking over schematics, player evaluation. Then we shift our focus to the senior bowl and the combine and scouting players mm-hmm. and evaluation and then going into who the Buffalo Bills have drafted and so on and so forth. And that carries us through training camp, mini camp and all these pieces. But once the preseason hits, Eric, we get real games that are happening. We get live bullets. We get real film to break down. And that's what we have here tonight in this episode of the cover one film room, where we dive into the Buffalo bills preseason week one victory versus the Indianapolis Colts. And regardless if the bills had won or lost, uh, Eric, it feels really good to have real football back. And for us in the show, it's nice to just know like, well, they played a game. Let's break it down instead of trying to figure out where we need to go for content. Right. You can only watch 2022 film so many times. And so we have new film and I'm sure you're, you know, I know I can speak for both of us. We've watched it probably four or five times over or more, you know, sometimes focusing on the grander scheme of things, schemes, concepts, assignments, sometimes looking at specific players mm-hmm. uh, on, you know, on a watch through. But, you know, what? I'm excited to break it down uh, tonight, offense and defensive side of the ball. But I'm most excited about all of our new sponsors, Anthony. We got three mm-hmm. new sponsors for the film room this season, guys. So let's give a, a you know a nice quiet clap for those guys. Nickel City Cigars is back for year two. Our new uh, sponsors are Easy Loan Auto Services, Auto Sales, and Jonathan Miller, my boy, great, great, great real estate agent in the Western New York area. So, you know, you guys bring a lot of exposure to us and, and interact with us and engage with us. These are the guys that are going to help us get through this season. And, you know, we couldn't do a lot of this stuff without you guys and our sponsors. Yeah, absolutely. And it's nice to, um, I think every, any time, like the sponsorship piece is nice, but it's also cool from like the, the other perspective of a business or a company or a person putting their faith in you because of the right. product that you have produced. So it's awesome to see nickel city re up for the second year and yeah, easy loan auto sales and, uh, Jonathan Miller with, uh, Metro Roberts realty. We're excited to welcome both That's of them right. on as sponsors for the show. And again, that all ties into the exposure and the fandom that you folks, uh, have for us and the engagement, the views and all that kind of stuff. So major kudos to everybody tuning in live here now or watching later, listening later, whatever have you. And again, major shout out to all the sponsors this year. If you are joining us live here on the show or watching post live here on YouTube, please, please, please. And thank you. Drop a like on this video. Likes are the lifeblood of streams and videos and these pieces on YouTube. They significantly impact the algorithm. So if you would be so kind, drop a like on this video. Also appreciate and recognize all the nice comments coming through for myself and Eric for the brand, for the bills. We're very excited. We know you folks are excited. And Eric, let's kind of dive into it. High level overview thoughts right now. You know, as you sit, game's done. Like you said, I oh yeah, I think I watched the tape literally four times going through different player yeah. pieces. It's it's nicer in the preseason because things are a bit more vanilla. So you don't have to sit and watch for the scheme and the structure and the trends, you know, it's kind of just like right. more basic concepts. So you're really watching more player evaluation pieces. But as you sit here after watching the game and then watching the tape, where's your head at right now? Overall high level takeaways from this game is your, is your mind on a certain player? Is it a certain side of the ball? Where's your head at right now when you're coming, when you're thinking about takeaways from this game? Well, I think you kind of alluded to it with the vanilla game plans, you know, mm-hmm. The purpose behind the preseason games is not for concepts and game planning. It's for evaluation, as you said. And I thought this uh, this game plan from especially the offensive side of the ball, um, I guess the defensive side of the ball, too, when we get to it, it was very it served a purpose. And Mm -hmm. you heard uh, I think it was Ken Dorsey today talk about how they put certain players in stressful situations Mm and challenging situations, i.e. Kincaid. He didn't play much. But when he did play, you saw him in line and you saw him blocking and, you know, that type of informations that typically knocks is the inside tight end Mm -hmm. in in 12 personnel. And then he would be the wing tight end off the line. Um, You saw it flipped and you saw him him having a block. And we're going to break down some of those plays. I felt like there was a certain purpose to uh, a lot of the coaching decisions and personnel that were used. I mean, the offensive line, they, they challenge a lot of these guys. They put them at different positions in game, within the game, within drives and things like that. But 
like you said, very basic, very vanilla, working on execution and just knowing your assignments, not game planning, just, you know, go ahead and, and do your job and do it to your best ability so that they can stack, you know, similar players at similar positions mm -hmm. and see how they did on the field. Yeah, I, that, that that's a tremendous takeaway. And I think that's also a key, a key thing to note for, for people watching these preseason games. And I don't know if that's necessarily like a known thing, like what you're getting in the preseason is yeah, that more basic level vanilla level concept on both sides of the ball. You're trying to stress players. You're trying to put them in situations to see what's going to happen with them. The Kincaid piece is a great example. I know in the post game show um, that I did after the game, a couple people came in and were like, Oh, how come no, like not a lot of reps for Kincaid, nothing really in the past game. And I was like, no, they're trying to, they're putting him in the spot that, he probably won't be in a lot of in the season. They want to right. see what's up. Yeah, put him in that inline situation. Let him go up against a defensive end or an edge and see what he's going to do and how he holds up and putting those guys in those situations and seeing how they do. And I thought it was nice. We got to see a little bit from Dalton, so, you know, from a rookie perspective, a little bit from Dalton Kincaid, a little bit from, or actually more of a lot of bit from Osiris Torrance. We got to see um, some interesting pieces for Dorian Williams. Kudos to you for a tremendous breakdown on what Dorian Williams did um, in that Bills versus Colts preseason game. If you folks haven't seen that, after this episode of The Film Room, go check out the Cover One YouTube page and check out the breakdown that Eric did on Dorian Williams' debut performance against the Colts. So we got to see some pieces from him. And, you know, it, it's nice to see. That's always my biggest takeaway, the the rookie performances and or new players that come in. Um, mm -hmm. You know, th this wasn't a ton of crazy free agent action this offseason. And Leonard Floyd didn't see a ton of snaps in this game. We saw some snaps from Montgomery, but nothing too crazy. So my eyes are really focused on the rookie performances. And I think we saw... Some encouraging play um, across the board, some a little more encouraging than others, but it was nice to see the rookies get acclimated, get their first test and their first try with things. And again, we're going to dive into some of those pieces tonight with some of those players um, really starting to take a peek at who they are when, while trying to figure out who they are based off of this first game. Yeah. Um, and again, that, that kind of that purpose behind it, you talked about, Kincaid and, and yet, you know, they didn't really target him in the passing game. Well, what the bills did do is kind of show some of their identity. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, yes, they didn't really pass it to him and why, you know, we don't want to see that. We don't want, mm -hmm. we want to save that for the regular mm -hmm. season, but they ran 12 personnel, 35.6% of the time, Anthony. So, and that was, you know, that's up there uh, in week one of the preseason. So again, there are some little like things you can pull from preseason, but more times than not, it's very vanilla, but it's, it's meant to evaluate. It's meant to challenge and stress the players on the field. Absolutely. And that that's a huge granted the, the bills 12 personnel usage last year was one of the lowest in the league, but what's muddy with that last year. And I, I've said it a bunch. I know you've said it as well. They did have a lot of Reggie Gilliam sets in there, but depending on what site is going to classify Reggie Gilliam as a fullback or a tight end, that's going to influence like the stats when you see 12 personnel versus mm -hmm. 22 personnel usage um, or 21 personnel usage, I should say. And if, Because if we're going back to last year, the Bills were 31st in the league with 12 personnel usage with 6%. So a 6% usage rate. Very low, 31st in the league. But they were sixth in the league when it came to 21 personnel usage rate. So two running backs, right. uh, one tight end at 17%. But again, that 21 personnel is that Reggie Gilliam piece. And some of those 21 personnel looks are more 12 personnel pieces. So the numbers might skew a bit. But regardless, even if you added those two together, Eric, like you said, those percentages last year would have put the Bills at a 23% usage rate for that kind of pro personnel, heavier personnel looking. So the Bills sitting here at 35.6, 12 personnel usage rate for week one is significant. And if you're looking at it um, from a league-wide perspective, like the Chiefs, for example, they had a 28% 12 personnel usage rate. That was third in the league last year. So if you're at that 30% usage rate for 12 personnel, that's usually where you're going to be like close to the top of, of, of the league when it comes to usage rate and the bills kind of blew that out of the water already. And you also have in this fantastic tweet, the average for week, uh, week one in the preseason for 12 personnel. So the bills blew out, blew out of the water, the average for the week for week one last year, in addition to kind of some of the trends from last season as well. Yeah. As I said, 35.6% of the plays uh, on Saturday against the Colts were with two tight end sets. And that was seventh overall for week one. Again, it's only one week, but again, the purpose behind that showing that and again, but not showing your total hand that give just something to hold on to 
as preseason and the early season starts. And so that was seventh overall. And the average, as you alluded to, was 26.1%. Mm -hmm. So this is drastically different than what we saw last year. So something to keep an eye on. Again, it serves a purpose. The preseason serves a purpose. But I thought, and you know, when we as we start to get into some of the nuts and bolts of what happened against the Colts, I want to start with the offensive line because mm -hmm. as you guys have seen on social media, a bunch of us that study the film at Cover One have shown a lot of different players along the offensive line and obviously a lot of depth players. And, and mm -hmm. I feel like we're starting to see them featured in many ways and you're starting to see a lot of the tools and techniques that Aaron Cromer has taught these guys over the last year, mm -hmm. year and a half start to kind of show it, you know, kind of rise to the top in, in some of the, I don't know, just little things. Like you're seeing a lot of the, you know, hand usage. You're mm. seeing a lot of, like, there were multiple guys that pulled snatch traps mm -hmm. in that game. Uh, there were multiple, you know, refitting of the hands and anchoring. Like you're seeing a lot of those chromerisms and a lot of those teaching moments start to really show on film, on, on, you know, on game days. And that to me, really stood out and even the demeanor, right? Some of the demeanor, mm -hmm. some of the nastiness was also, you know, reflected across all three levels when, when you're talking to the depth chart of the offensive line. That's an excellent point. That was one of my big takeaways from the offensive line has been a focal point um, for, for the off season. I know we've spoke, spoken about it on this show, just with what we saw last year and how important that grouping was. And then what they did to address it this year, you know, bringing in Connor McGovern, bringing in David Edwards, drafting Osiris Torrance, a lot of focus on the offensive line. And yeah, to your point, it was cool to see in week one from the starters to the second string to the third string, you saw a lot of similar technique pieces being mm -hmm. used. I was really pleased with a lot of the hand placement. There was really good hand action, like good punch technique. Not, not all guys are going to have the same level of pop or shock in their hands, but we saw mm -hmm. good hand placement right into the chest. We saw good mobility from a lot of guys, a good, a good amount of technique being displayed from the first team through second, third, fourth stringers, um, and so that was a big takeaway for me. Another big takeaway for, for me as well was the downhill run game mm. for the Bills. And it's something, Eric, we've talked about a bunch. Osiris Torrance versus Ryan Bates, whoever wins that right guard job, both of them are such different players from a size and frame perspective and a skill set perspective. Bates, as we've talked about ad nauseum, somebody you want to get out more in space. You want him to pull. You want to use that athleticism. Torrance, he's a people mover. He's got these vice grip hands. You want him working downhill, creating vertical displacement, chucking dudes out of the way. We saw early on. Oh, I think what the, the 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 first offensive series were three run plays. Two of them were duo, um, including the very first one. They're getting downhill with duo runs. We're seeing some inside zone. We're seeing more of that vertical displacement downhill attack identity. More little again, very early, but previously we've seen a bunch of you know we saw a lot of dart last year. It was a concept dart a mid zone. Pull. Yeah, ton of pin and pull. All these pieces, and we kept talking about you know Torrance. He's a much different interior offensive lineman than mm -hmm. what they have on the roster. So his injection into the lineup might lead to some different things schematically. And granted, it's one preseason game, but it was it was interesting to see them kind of push some of those downhill run attack buttons early on and often in that game. Yeah, again, they kept it simple. They wanted to see early, especially early on. They wanted to see. With the formations, again, heavier set formations than normal. They weren't in spread formations yeah. with a lot of those starters when we're talking guys up front. And they said, you know what? We're just going to run downhill. And, you know, there was mixed success. But mm -hmm. I thought the combinations between the offensive linemen were great. I think some of the combinations between the tackle and tight ends or tight ends and tight ends mm -hmm. worked really well and created that displacement. I, I like the combinations. Again, they kept it pretty simple. There weren't many pulls. Um, but they kept it simple. They got downhill and those decisions for the running backs were made that much easier mm -hmm. because of those good combinations. I mean, cook looked really good. Murray looked really oh, good. Dude. Mims had some flash, like every running yeah. back had very decisive downhill type reads, not a lot of perimeter type runs. They just got downhill and got what they could. And I just think the reads for the running backs were that much easier on these zone runs. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, there were a couple where I was really impressed with the offensive line. There was one in particular with the second team 
Ryan Bates and David Edwards work in a combo block and Bates, and Bates is at center and he just executes this perfect feed block, feed. chucks the hell out of the de- defensive mm-hmm. tackle. And all Edwards has to do, he just turns and shields, he uses his inside arm and just seals him completely. Bates climbs to the second level. And when I saw Bates that, backer, yep. yeah, yeah, it was that was really nice. Like f- you don't see that a lot with, it's one of, and again, I, I don't play in the NFL, but it's a thing that annoys me like crazy with like the feed blocks for the like the double teams. Like Philadelphia is tremendous at it. When you see those pairings, ah, that's the one. You Philly is tremendous. Where you know, granted, Jason Kelsey's a fantastic center, but he's one of those guys who, when he executes that feed block, like he chucks the hell out of his man. And Bates does that here. Like that's a great assist. Ninety three gets put off his feet and gets chucked completely out of the gap. Edwards steps up and seals him. But even look at the way like. Edward seal Edward seals him like he gets the hand right in mm-hmm. there. It's like he's Leverage. turning him. He's torquing him. Yeah, there's leverage. Mm. There's a little bit of nastiness to it. And then Bates climbs to the second level, pops the linebacker. And to your point, if you're Latavius Murray, all of a sudden there's this huge hole downhill and you're like, oh, let me just put my right foot in the ground and step left. Even some good footwork there from Torrance. There were a couple of these reps where to exactly your point, the offensive line made it very easy for the running back to be like, here's your lane. Go ahead and get it. Yeah, I, I thought the offensive line was challenged. I think in many ways, especially when we're talking the run game, they they answer it. And it's a great segue into the conversation when it comes down to the competition between mm-hmm. Torrance and Bates. And uh, we saw uh, a tweet today um, from Matt Bove um, from the press conference with Ken Dorsey. And I want to bring that up here. Okay, so Matt... Uh, go ahead and leads into this with Ken Dorsey says he believes it is an open competition at right guard. However, that thing shakes out. Mm -hmm. Ryan Bates will be an integral part of this offense. So Mm -hmm. to me and to a lot of people, I think they took it like, okay, it sounds like, you know, it's Torrance's job, but Mm -hmm. the conversation I want to have, because I do think it's a true competition. I'm told it is a true competition, Mm -hmm. but I, you know, we had Ryan Bates in the film room last year. And he straight told us when he had won the right guard job years ago, even during practice, during game week, 80% of his time was taking snaps at center because that's how important he is. And obviously, and how important Mitch Morse is, if he goes down, Bates has to go in there and, and operate flawlessly with Josh mm-hmm. Allen. So obviously Bates is probably one of the smarter offensive linemen that's on that, you know, in that group. But mm. more importantly, that we've ever talked to, the guy blew us away in the film room when we were talking about you know, offensive line stuff and technique. Um, but he's the type of guy that is so smart and knows all the positions. To be honest, he doesn't have to take a lot of reps Good point. at X position, right guard. You know, get those reps with the first team for Torrance because we know that Bates can do it. He can, he can execute those jobs and assignments. Mm-hmm. So... I think that's the interesting conversation about this. It, I do think that they want Torrance to win this job. And I, but I also think that Bates has tremendous value to this offensive line and to the future. I think he's the starting center next year. Mm. So that those are mm. things that we need to start having the conversation about, not just, okay, Torrance is going to win. They want him to win. They're setting yeah. him up for success. But they're also thinking about the bigger picture when it comes to the other positions and the depth behind, again, Mitch Morse, Connor McGovern, Mm -hmm. and even and maybe not the tackles as much as early on, but the interior offensive line. Bates is he's that swing guy. Yeah, I that's a tremendous point. It's something we've stated all year. Like I selfishly, and this would, I maybe it sucks for Ryan Bates for this year. I love the idea that my 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 best solution or best you know outcome is. Torrance wins that right guard, right guard job, because I'm in love with the idea of Ryan Bates as this super sub. You've got this player who is an above average player at all three interior offensive line spots. And I'm saying above average, like as a loose cast a wide net, he's a good guard and he's a more than functional center. And you've got one guy who can step in at all three spots and he displays fluidity and athleticism and technique and having that guy there at at a position on the offensive line where it's hard for your starting five to stay healthy yeah. throughout the entire football season. Somebody at some point we is going to get every, every single year, whether it's the bills, any team, like your offensive line is going to get banged up. They're getting hit on every single play. Guys are getting rolled up onto one another, getting tangled. It's going to happen at some point. I love the idea of Ryan Bates just kind of waiting in the wings and being like, 
Oh, left guard, cool. Center, cool. Right guard, cool. And again, we've talked about maybe even in a huge pinch, he can pop out to a tackle spot, but the interior is really where you're going to see that value for him. And I love the idea of Torrance winning that job. I also like the more physical presence he gives in that downhill running attack and how it pairs sure. with some other things schematically. But I really love the idea of Ryan Bates, and that's not us just I, – I feel like some people might hear that and be, <laughs> oh, we're just blowing smoke or it's because he's been on the show – no, like, dude is so cerebral. He's so smart. Yeah. And the value that you have as they – could you – imagine if you had that guy at one of the tackle spots last year. Wouldn't you have felt better as a Bills fan? It's the, it's that – that's what's happening this year on the interior if Torrance wins that job. And like we showed in that clip briefly a minute ago, what he did at center, he executes consistently at guard and at center. He gives you a lot of options. And knowing that you've got that guy who can fill in – and it's and it helps with the roster, Right. Because you've got one guy who can fill yeah. into three spots. It, it adds a couple extra roster spots for you to play with and do some chess piece work with and fit some puzzle pieces together. He's a very, like you said, very, very valuable component to this offense. Whether or not he starts, he's very valuable. Yeah, and I mean, I do agree with all of your points about Torrance. And we're going to break down a few plays from his you know, debut for the Bills. But I also worry that you're putting Torrance... Right next to Spencer Brown. Yes. I like that right from a from, I Brown. like that from a run perspective, but from a pass pro perspective, I get a little oh. nervous. Yeah, and you're gonna see some of the run stuff, those combinations yeah. between Brown and Torrance might be some of the best combinations as the year progresses. The physical, they're gonna move and, people. Uh, yeah, they're the gonna nastiness? move, they're gonna move yes. people. But when pass you see protection? wide alignments, <laughs> when you see wide alignments like we'll talk about versus Torrance and a wide alignment versus Brown, yeah, to the front side of Josh Allen when he's dropping back. It, it could be very dangerous. And if I, when I think about the different stunts and games that teams yeah. like to run against the Bills, I'm worried. And, I, and we'll talk about that. Let's get into some of the baits, <laughs> or the, some of the torrent stuff, because, you know, let's get into some of the film, because, um, you know, this is what you guys are here for. So let's get into some of this good stuff. Let me bring it up and make it uh, full screen here so you guys can see it. All right. So here are the combination blocks that we are talking about. So early in the game, Watch the combination block between Spencer Brown. They're working that first level to the linebacker, Franklin. But this is what you see here. I think overall, Torrance did a good job getting to the second level mm -hmm. in this game. But this is one of those plays where they're getting that movement and that displacement we always talk about. Mm -hmm. But he didn't quite pick up that linebacker, and mm -hmm. he's the guy that makes a tackle. But, I mean, when you're looking at the yardage and movement they got, Anthony, you can't you can't really complain about that. And more times than not, coaches want the first level secure. Mm -hmm. They don't care about the linebacker at the second level. If you're moving the line of scrimmage four yards each play, like that's the type of type of movement you want from your offensive lineman. Yeah, and and, and that's an excellent point. Like th this play is a win. Like you get five or six yards right away because you have how much you win at the line of scrimmage there. I'm cool with that. I would have loved Torrance to get a better piece of Franklin at the second level. And, and Eric, that's something we talked about when we broke down Torrance's game coming from Florida. Like he wasn't necessarily consistent in his contact with players at the second mm -hmm. level, but I was encouraged by some of his movement in this game. And I think some of it is tied to, you know, him leaning out or thinning out a little bit um, mm -hmm. in terms of how he came into camp, not being as heavy or as, as much of a load um, like he was at Florida, but exactly your point. They went at the first level, Spencer Brown finishes off the combo block and drives his man into mm -hmm. the turf. There's the physicality. There's the nastiness. Watch Brown just mm. drive his dude into the dirt falls on him for good measure. Um, Torrance doesn't get a complete piece of Franklin at the second level, but exactly your point, you've already won at that point. I would love for Torrance to get a piece of Franklin and that alley to open up, and then all of a sudden it's James Cook one-on-one -on -one with Nick Cross at safety, and we see what mm -hmm. we can get. But I'll yep. take a, I'll take an easy five- or six-yard gain that puts me into second and five, second and four, and that's what you get here because of, this, of the displacement they created at that first level. Yeah, and really good cuts from Cook on that play. So mm -hmm. let's get into some of the pass pro stuff. So on this play, I want you guys to pay attention to what I outlined there. Hand placement, his balance, and recovery. Because, And this is a wide alignment. This is what we're talking about. You see, this is a wide three, almost a four eye. And then you got a wide alignment from this, you know, basically a, a, a wide nine from that yeah. edge player. But watch how this, you know, really can cause issues for Torrance. He's aggressive, first of all. That's what we want. You want to finish mm -hmm. near the line of scrimmage, especially off play action. You're trying to sell like it's a run. So it's a mm -hmm. tight, quick kick slide attacking the defensive line. You see him kind of throw out his, his right hand 
uh, to, to really uncover what the pass rusher is doing. But you can see right there, mm. that pass rusher does a good job of get, using his length and getting the outside edge versus mm -hmm. Torrance. And then watch what Torrance does right there. You see him kind of falling back. Uh, luckily, the pass rusher led up there because I think if this is a better pass rusher, if this is a better defensive tackle, he's got that short edge. And this quarterback is flattened. Yo, that was my biggest question on this. I like why I was like, why didn't 98 just keep attacking? Like he let Torrance kind of recover there a little bit. I thought he was heading dead to rights. And exactly to your point, if that's a better guy, Torrance might be in more severe trouble there. Oh yeah. I mean, look at him. He, he doesn't have his base under yeah. him, but I will, again, recovery is a thing. It's a trait. It's a skill. Yeah. And so he does recover here. And the most important thing is putting your body in between the pass rusher and the quarterback. He does that. Now look at this pocket. This is a really nice pocket. Again, I need to see Josh Allen do this routinely. Will mm -hmm. Josh stand in this hallway when, when a pass rusher is doing this up the middle Yeah. against Torrance? I need to see it because there are times, there were times last year, obviously the offensive line was a little different, but there were times where Josh Allen just wanted to escape. And mm -hmm. so this worries me a little bit. And this is the type of stuff, again, he recovered. I'm giving him credit for that. But this is stuff that, you know, I don't know if Josh Allen hangs in the pocket in the very same manner that you saw Allen, uh, Kyle Allen do here. That's an excellent point. I, I can very likely see that spot where 98 has Torrance off kilter and he's trying to anchor him. So right there, I can see yeah. Allen seeing that, Josh Allen seeing that start to happen and seeing this to his right and him going, screw it, I'm out and just running straight ahead and trying to get the four, five, mm -hmm. six yards on the ground himself. And part of that is due to Eric, like you said, like what we saw last year, I don't want to say skittish from the perspective of like Allen gets uneasy and erratic in the pocket. But when he starts to see that pressure or feels it, he kind of just is like, you know what? Screw it. I'll do it myself and I'll correct for things. And that's an excellent point. Like I could see Allen seeing this right here and not sitting in the pocket and just being like, I'm going to take off. And it's going to be very interesting to see how that piece works in tandem and in conjunction with Josh Allen's style. But exactly to your point, you know, uh, a good enough recovery from Torrance, I think, you know, some of that recovery, like we said, was aided by 98, really not going for the kill shot there, not going for that piece. Um, and then just to highlight a couple other pieces here, a really good rep from Ryan Bates with a little support from David Edwards um, early on at left guard. They work together and then Bates just sticks in front of his man, refits that left hand right into the chest of 93. Boom, right here with that refit, gets it underneath and and sits. And then uh, a pretty good rep from Vandemark at left tackle, who I was I was pleasantly surprised with Vandemark at left tackle. Um, dis, I, I was going to try to find a nice way to say it. Not as thrilled with his right tackle performance, um, but pleasantly ugly. surprised. Yeah, it was, wasn't great. Um, yeah. He also got burned horribly the play right after this one at left tackle, yeah. I believe. But uh, a decent rep there from Vandermark, some encouraging play, um, and a recovery from Torrance uh, after initially kind of being put in a bad spot. Right, and here's another one. Again, you see the hand fake. You see the the wide hands. That's something you can't you can't play consistently with because it'll expose your chest as an offensive lineman. But mm. watch the the hand fake again. Forces that guy to, to kind of show his move. You see the double handed swipe, mm. and then again the recovery. But look at his he's bending there. He's at bending at the hips. That's a big no no. And then look yeah. at the crossover, the feet. He's These are things we need to to keep an eye on. Again, great recovery. Look, mm -hmm. maybe. Torrance, uh, because he does look lighter, he looks trimmer, he looks more mm -hmm. athletic. Mm -hmm. He and, and physically and athletically, you're seeing his his feet look better than what we saw yes. uh, at Florida. Um, you know, in the film last year. But so this is really a good recovery, and maybe he doesn't do that, you know, in college. But uh again, better pass rushers at D tackle where things are happening faster, guys with better pass rush plans. I do worry about that, but again, kudos on this play. It's ugly. You got the job done. Hey, you know, I always preach with how what Howard Mudd says, just get the job done. However mm -hmm. it is, you cross over your feet. That's okay. Guess what? Get your body in between the pass rusher and the quarterback. He does. He locks it down and passes off. So again, can only criticize so much. He mm -hmm. got the job done. Yeah, I'll take it. Like, I don't care, you know, winning ugly or winning pretty. The first part is all that matters, which is the win. And he wins, you know, he stays, like you said on, on the previous clip, he stays in between his man and the quarterback. This area though, this type of situation was one of my biggest concerns for him coming into the league. I worry, Eric, to your point of, you know, if he's going up against better rushers and or 
quicker power guys in some kind of combination, especially the speed and quickness piece. My biggest concern was their ability to get around his outside shoulder and press that arc and create a short edge and be able to push right through and flatten. It was one of my biggest concerns for him coming in. So it worries me a little that we saw it on multiple reps early on for him against the Colts here. But again, that's us really kind of nitpicking the hell out of it to see the sustainability. At the end of the day, he recovered just like he did on the previous play. And you're seeing some of the, the, the nice things that you like. I like, you know, him feigning that right hand to get mm-hmm. the, uh, to get 98 to declare. And then you see the grip strength, you see the power in the arms and the hands. And some of this recovery is nice. I don't know if, 330 pound, 330 plus pound Osiris Torrance at Florida or at the senior bowl. I don't know if he's recovering and making this play, even if 98 does let up. So I think some of, you know, him trimming down, like you said, I think that's helped him to help him to be a little more athletic and more uh fleet of foot for his size. So again, kudos to him, but you are, there are some things there we'd like to see him clean up. Yeah, no doubt, man. Again, th- this is a, a good rep in the end. I just, I don't know. Maybe, I need to see it with Josh Allen routinely because, yeah. again, Josh Allen's not the type of guy that just hangs in one spot in, yeah. at the top of his drop. So yeah. as he moves in the pocket, how does Tor- – it's, it's different. And, and Bates is one that talked about it with us mm-hmm. last year. Blocking for uh, different quarterbacks, blocking for Josh Allen than another quarterback is a lot different. That's, a, that, that's a great point. It. Yeah, we talk about it all the time of like Allen's mobility and pocket manipulation is – such a benefit for the offensive line because it gets them out of certain jams and makes them right. Even when they're wrong, but on the other side of it, you also have to know how to block for that as an offensive lineman, because Josh Allen's not a quarterback to your point. Yeah. Who, you know, seven step drop and he's going to sit at the top of the drop or step up. It could be a seven step drop and he might run anywhere and everywhere. And that can make life difficult for an offensive lineman. Right. And here's another one. You see him as you, you talked about fan that right hand again, Wide alignment, uh, the guy tries a cross chop with him. Uh, again, gets his hands inside right there, and I like this one because he just widens that guy out. Mm-hmm. See, yeah. now he's working. He's what Howard Muzz, it, Mudd says is walking the line right here. So if there's an imaginary line right there, you see him walking down that line and staying in between the quarterback and that pass rusher. I, I really like this rep from him. Mm-hmm. Keep him out wide. I'm okay with that. Keep him out wide. You know, one thing – that we'll see if Torrance is a starter with Brown there is, yeah, these wide alignments could create issues, but these guys are upfield. Mm-hmm. Hello, right? Hello, Josh yeah. Allen running running out there and getting out into that second phase and, and throwing to his right, by all means. Like, the Bills are okay with that. <laughs> like, it, yeah. if you want to r- rush wide, and as long as Torrance can keep that edge and, and walk that line and walk him by the quarterback spot in the pocket, then we're in business. This was a really good rep and good job of widening that passing lane. Absolutely. And this one's really nice when you compare it to, um, you know, the, the reps we saw before and, and you hit it on one of the previous reps where he's, he's a little too far out in front of his feet and you see more bend at the waist and him leaning over a bit more. There's more of a straight line symmetry. He's, he's got better positioning. Yes. There's more of a lean. There's more of a 45 degree angle than it is kind of like a 90 degree bend from him. He's more upright. His hands are moving in tandem with his feet. And look at that positioning right there. I love mm-hmm. he's back upright. He's got great hand positioning. He's in control. His man is off kilter. And you see exactly like you said, like him hold that line and just drive his man. And for a quarterback, like not even just Josh Allen, but any quarterback, if you can maintain the interior of that pocket and it's nice and clean and pretty, and you can keep everything to the outside now, you have a nice clean spot for a quarterback to operate. And then for Josh Allen, he's got the opportunity to step up, to make a play with his arm, to make a play with his legs. That's a nice piece that was one of the pros that we talked about of him coming to the offense, which is, you know, him potentially helping the stability of the interior of the depth of the interior of the pocket um, for Josh Allen going forward. All right. And I think this is the last clip right here. This is a, a mid zone run to the left side. And you see, you talked about that feed block, you know, backside hand. You're supposed to punch this guy over to shell and then go and get that linebacker at the next level. I think he does a good job of doing mm-hmm. that. And this is that athleticism on this play. He's getting to that second level, picking up that linebacker. And then you see him just drive him out. He mm-hmm. just drives him out there. So a really nice play here on the backside. It's a backside cutoff. Punch over to shell. Get that guy. Look at that. I mean, it, it helped him too, right? He yep. seals this off. And that's where you see that cutback kind of come up inside with Murray. So really good backside cutoff block 
from Torrance and, and movement to the second level. You can see with that feed block with how he really helps shell. Like when he punches right there, mm-hmm. 96 for the Colts, he gets turned like perpendicularly. Like you see him get turned completely. His shoulder is opened up. He has lost leverage. He's lost momentum. Like, yeah, that turn right there, credit to shell for, you know, getting across his face, but that's set up because of the feed block and the punch and the strength there from Osiris Torrance. So I love that. And I love, yeah, him climbing to the second level. Um, Again, it was one of the concerns I had with the tape coming out from Florida. And I think this is where him trimming down a bit helps him when he would climb to the second level he at Florida it was a bit at times kind of like a runaway freight train almost like he was so heavy that he was going and if he had to break down it was a little harder for him to do that but you see him moving to the second level with urgency but he's under control it's controlled urgency and you see him make contact drive his man out if he can add consistency in this part of his game man the the downhill run game with him and Spencer Brown on that right side of the line, like, like we alluded to earlier, Eric, that just gets so fun because of the physicality and the athleticism and the power. Like there's a lot you can do with guys who can move like that and function with that type of power and strength. Yeah, no doubt, man. Uh, just some really good reps, you know, from Torrance. I think it was a good debut overall, but I also do think that there are some things that we need to pay attention to. Right. And and we kind of outline those things. But again, we are critiquing and being a little picky, but we just want you to watch that closely as the preseason progresses, but also as the season starts. Because if he wins, you're going to see teams challenge him. We asked him, we asked him at the senior bowl, like, how did teams challenge you? Mm-hmm. You know, and he said the outer edge, because you can't work him down the cylinder, you can't go right down. Broadway with him mm-hmm. or inside. He shuts down inside shades and head up shades easily. Mm-hmm. You have to beat him with speed around the outside, shorten that edge, as you said, and flatten to the quarterback. And so he's going to see this week in and week out in passing situations. We just need to see him hold up better because there were some moments where like, Ooh, this was a better pass rusher. If this was yeah. above average pass rusher, he was going to get beaten. But again, yeah. kudos to him. Really, mm-hmm. really good showing in that in that first uh in that first game for him in the preseason so Prom- promising and encouraging yeah very much so yeah no doubt about it man so all right on to our first segment brought to you by easy loan auto sales we're gonna call this making it look easy and james cook made it look really easy on this touchdown anthony <laughs> literally like we couldn't it's funny when you get a play that perfectly lines up with a sponsor and right. this is the play like cook just I don't want to say like takes his foot off the gas, but he almost just coasts on this one because of the lane that opens up for him on the outside with how Knox climbs to the corner on the outside. And yeah, Cook literally makes it look easy as he has a nice little skip across the goal line. But Eric, this one, you know, this highlight or shout out to Cook here for the speed and the vision, um, like what Dawson Knox does, like what Sherfield does. But let's add a little focus here to Mr. Dalton Kincaid, who this is – this kind of block shows you what he can do, but also he need what he needs to work on. Like you see the willingness, you see good initial hand placement and some violence, but then you see him lose a little bit of his leverage and balance. He does this on a similar clip later, but I thought this was a good, this play was also a good representation of what Kincaid can be as a blocker, even though again, like we talked about, he's more in line here in this situation than he really will be as more of the move guy or the F guy, like we anticipate in the season. But again, not a horrible block does his job, but you also see where he has his areas of opportunity as a blocker. Right. And we're in 12 personnel again, normally in camp, we saw Knox in Kincaid spot. So again, purpose and they're purposely doing this uh with Kincaid so you see man coverage from the defense and this is where the scheme plays into it so Sherfield comes in he doesn't just stop off outside of Knox he goes inside of Kincaid basically right behind Kincaid and you see what that does to the guy that's over him that brings him inside and that opens up this edge out here so Beautiful. really nice little scheme design there because Sherfield's picking up that linebacker right there and then now Cook has the speed to get the edge. Don't You don't need much from Knox, but it's really a foot race between Cook and Flowers. And as I said, Cook makes it look easy for the six points. Good way to start off this game, right, Ant? But also a good way to start off the year for our sponsors. Absolutely. Tremendous. Uh, I think I like to think that Ken Dorsey threw us a bone here with this touchdown to make it easy for <laughs> easy loan auto sales. Uh, and again, we're super proud of that partnership. 
Um, regardless of your credit situation, Easy Loan uh, helps you get behind the wheel and on the road to better credit. All their vehicles include a two-year, 24,000-mile warranty, and they have three convenient locations in Buffalo, Lockport, and Niagara Falls. Go to EasyLoanAuto.com to start your accelerated approval today. And you see that acceleration, acceleration there uh, from James Cook. I also like to think, too, you know, not to knock anybody – this is where that speed for Cook makes a difference. If you have maybe a less speedy back, maybe he isn't able to hit that corner and outrun Flowers there. But again, Cook makes it look easy because of his speed, his fluidity. And I also want to shout out one, two other points. I love this package of 12 personnel with Sherfield as one of the wide receivers because mm-hmm. it just gives you so many options in the run and the pass. And also... As you alluded to, the schematic design there from Ken Dorsey, he's been doing some things uh, in the red zone, in camp, and in the scrimmage, and in in this preseason game early that kind of built on some of the improvements we saw him work through last year when we broke down the struggles in the red zone early on and what they did. So a lot to like from an individual perspective, a schematic standpoint, and from a sponsor standpoint on this play. No doubt. All right, on to the next play. And it's really where we start to talk about some of the wide receivers, right. And some of the younger wide receivers, to be honest, because I thought the new coach, Henry, coach Henry, the wide receivers Mm -hmm. coach, we got to see some of his work kind of show up when we're talking in the wide receivers and some of the nuance uh, to the wide receivers game. And I'm talking the guys, the middle of the depth chart and the lower end of the depth chart guys were showing out, you know, I mean, whether it's Marcel Aitman, whether, whether, you know, Sh- Shakir had some some moments. He also had mm-hmm. some down moments, a little yeah. inconsistent. But um, Patman had a great game. Mm-hmm. Keyshawn Johnson, Andy Isabella. Let's get into these guys, right? Because I normally don't get swept up by bottom <laughs> of the depth chart competition. or But I don't know, for some reason, I, I'm all in on this competition. And it really started... Uh, with Shakir on this play again, he had a drop on third down. I know, I know it, it was bad. It was really bad, but Anthony, I really like this concept here. One, and it's one that we see a lot, right? You know, you get a clearing route from the slot and then you get that deep dig otherwise known as a dagger concept. And mm-hmm. I mean, there's, there's, this is a hell of a throw. First of all, yes. look, at, look at the anticipation and then the catch in traffic by Shakir on this, on this deep dig route uh, past the sticks on third down. I love a good dagger concept because it works against multiple types of coverages and you see Morris pull that coverage from the interior and Shakir just slides in behind him. There's a lot to like on this play, even just aside from the initial design. I love how, so this is, I believe third and 12. Um, I love how Shakir knows where the first down marker is. He gets past the sticks. He settles in. Awesome. Again, I know Kyle Allen has been taking a lot of flack. This is a really good throw into not necessarily the tightest window, but with good anticipation, you see Quentin Morris. Yeah. Quentin Morris is pulling 43, like you highlighted there. So that spot in the seam is going to be open. So Shakir just needs to get inside the corner and over the top of that underneath flat defender, which he does. Allen puts it on him, but a little high. You see full extension from Shakir, a nice, hands catch away from the body a good catch radius catch with some athleticism and then this part at the end is arguably my favorite when you start to go in slow motion he ids 50 coming to hit him and he puts his body and turns as soon as that right foot hits the ground he turns and shields the ball as he tucks it away that's a really good awareness type of play in traffic on a third down to generate a big conversion and a big catch. So there was a lot to like on this play. I was extremely excited seeing Shakir pull this in, seeing the throw from Allen and how everything worked in conjunction with one another. Right. And I had someone on Twitter say like, Oh, if Kyle would have sat on this route a little longer, he would have had him." as soon as this guy, this is cover three, but this is more of like the Dallas Cowboys cover three, the Seattle cover three, where, as soon mm. as that guy works up the seam, this guy's going to turn and run. So he's reading, essentially reading the hips of this guy. Mm-hmm. And as you said, that guy's hips turn, and then that's where that that space comes from for that dagger concept. Uh, really nice throw, really nice catch in traffic. And I thought Shakir overall, real quick, I thought he had a good game. It was a, mm-hmm. it was a tough drop, right? It was a tough drop yes. and a wide open speed out. But I will say he did also have another nice contested catch to the top of the screen. It was like a was a stop route or a comeback. Yeah, later on later on this drive where right. Allen puts the ball out a little late and he shows strong hands, reaches out, snatches it. Right, and you know we're seeing a lot of comments about wide receiver six, and 
everyone's talking about this next guy, right? And I mean, everyone is talking mm. about Isabella, right? Beasley, I mean, Beasley 2.0. Uh, Beasley 2.0, uh, go to Bella or yeah, something I, like that, I right? I called him Andy, Andy wide receiver, one Bella and Andy go to Bella. <laughs> I love it. I freaking love it. Um, so we're going to get into his play there. And this, uh, again, this segment is brought to you by Jonathan Miller. Our, our Again, our dude. If you mm -hmm. guys are looking for a home in the Western New York area, regardless of price point, he's the guy you want to contact. We'll give you his phone number in the description. So after the show, if you are looking for a home, whether you're looking to buy or looking to sell, he can help you out. He's, he's a guy like us when it comes to the film, right? And mm. like we use all the different types of technology we can. We're using Huddle right now. I got my handy dandy clicker. <laughs> we use all the different technology just like John does when it comes to selling or buying homes. He he used drone footage, 3D mm -hmm. uh, virtual tours. Um, and all of those are like part of the base package of hiring him. Um, and I, as I said, he works with all different price points and uh, sellers and buyers. And uh, some of his commission from a sale will go towards charity. Um, and like I said, we'll, we'll definitely, you know, link his information in the YouTube description, but this is what we're going to call for the season, our real estate rewind. Mm. And it's Isabella's route, right? It's Il Isabella's route, that juke route Ooh. over the middle of the field. I mean, just filthy, filthy. Yeah. I don't care who it's against. Yeah. Again, we're trying to evaluate if he can run this type of route because it's a route the bills used to run a lot of yep. with Cole Beasley. Hoss juke. Yeah, and they didn't or weren't able to really run it with McKenzie because of the type of player McKenzie was. But mm -hmm. this play, you have to rewind it several times because <laughs> of how nasty this move is oh. from Isabella. The pacing is it and first off, actually, as you like let it run here, you can always tell how good a play is by how hyped the sideline is. And the sideline loves the hell out of this play. Like as he gets brought down at the end. You see Diggs over there. You see Sherfield over there. Spencer Brown is loving it. Micah yeah. Hyde loves it. Josh is yep, Josh Josh, over there too. Boom. Allen gets into it. Barkley gets into it. Like Gabe Davis is there. Like everybody kind of wants to get, get a piece of Isabella to let him know like how dope of a play that was. Right. And, and it's real clean. Like I, and I want to say this because I think we may have contributed to some of the hype. Like no. it, th th <laughs> there, this was a very good performance from Andy Isabella, like not necessarily from a holistic stat line, but how he ran his routes and how that fits in conjunction with the bills offense. Very encouraging. That being said, you know, there, it is kind of a decently steep hill for him to climb and make in the yeah. roster, but either way, if you're just looking at it in a vacuum, a good performance in this game, a really good route here, like that juke route over the middle of the field, based on the coverage he's going to get, he's basically in isolation against that linebacker, which is a huge mismatch, and he makes it look like a mismatch. He had multiple successful routes and conversions in this game as that number three receiver to the trip side with him getting isolated on a nickel corner inside or on a linebacker here. Mm -hmm. And as you highlight, he puts that right foot in the ground. He has the opportunity for a little two-way go here. So he puts his foot in the ground. The linebacker's thinking he's popping out on an out or like a whip route. He's going back outside. And what's also nice, Isabella runs this right at the sticks, which the linebacker knows. So the linebacker's making a beeline thinking, oh, here comes the, here comes the quick game. Let me go make a play. And Isabella sits on it enough. He paces it and then shoots back out. He creates instant separation over the middle of the field, makes this read and this job for Kyle Allen so easy and so fluid. Look at the separation. Like that's an easy three, four yards of separation. And then we get something that I think this is what endeared him to, to Bill's mafia, the run after the catch. Like everybody has been clamoring for run after catch year after year after year. Right. So for me, it's the precision, it's the pacing, it's the timing, it's the suddenness. He had another um, really good, route with some pacing and some suddenness later in the yeah yep. beautiful what's coming through um but this one just a, a lot to like for what he did and you can not you can hype it up all you want you can knock it all you mm -hmm. want but just looking at it in a vacuum really quality route in a in a big situation and kudos to him for doing it yeah and you know again it's Oof. an uphill battle for him but yeah. i what i we we talked about it all off season and we're talking about the draft and how the Bills have to get back to control in the middle of the field to set up guys outside and, and control the sticks and control the tempo of the game. Yes, Kincaid is going to help a lot in that department. Harder, uh, Hardy is going to help a lot in that area. But again, 
Hardy's another guy when we're talking injuries has had injuries mm -hmm. the last few years. Yes. Hardy's also a guy that is going to be probably their primary returner. Mm -hmm. These are things that Isabella does. So will he make the starting 53? Probably not, but he's a guy that the bills are going to try to probably put on at least a practice squad. They're going to, they, yeah. I think after what he's shown in a short amount of time, I think they'll, they want that sort of insurance for Hardy, who I think, is going to have a decent role this year. Yeah, we, we we've talked Hardy's skill set up, um, and not just because he was brought to the Bills. Like when you watch the tape, he's got suddenness, he's got decisiveness in his route, and then you add the speed and the burst. But Eric, like you mentioned, like the biggest knock, he just he can't stay healthy for whatever reason, and it's more than just some fluky things. So having somebody kind of waiting in the wings with a similar skill set like Andy Isabella would be a huge boon for this offense. And like Charles says, you think Isabella won't get claimed. You know, it's tough. He he's been dropped basically by two teams this off season, yeah. once by the Cardinals, once by the Ravens, both teams that could use wide receiver reinforcement. Granted right. they are, you know, the Cardinals are under a new regime. So, you know, he was a second round pick of the former regime. So maybe they're not a fan. So they're, they're cutting bait um, for whatever reason, Todd Munkin and the crew in, in Baltimore weren't a fan. But if you get a guy who, has some veteran experience and who shows out this way, if he continues to do well and has these moments, it could be tough for a guy like that to go to the practice squad. And that's, that's the risk. Eric, we saw it last year with Isaiah Hodgins, right? A guy yeah. who had a really good off season and preseason maybe wasn't enough to crack the 53, but was better than being just a practice squad guy on the bills and a team who needed a wide receiver and the giants scooped him up and he started making plays. You could potentially see a similar path for Andy Isabella. Granted they're on different trajectories with their career. Yeah. Like I said, I normally don't get swept up in this type of banter, but <laughs> I don't know for some reason it's not even just Isabella. It's going to be a, a couple of the other guys we talk about too, because of uh, again, just the depth at the wide receiver position for the Bills, I like it. I like mm -hmm. the different skill sets, the different the basketball team mentality of mm. you know guys with different skill sets. Yes. On top of again, you're the hybrid type players you're getting in Kincaid and and, and Knox now. So, and then Cook as a receiver, right. like yeah. it's it's fun. It's fun to have these weapons, and I think having different types of weapons at the bottom part of the wide receiver depth chart. Is fun. It's a fun conversation to have, and uh, this this route was just filthy, which is why we had to uh, name it the Real Estate Rewind for the week. Just really, really good stuff from Isabella, and we have more from Isabella. And mm -hmm. this is that route you're talking about. Another third down play. He's the number three receiver mm -hmm. in the middle of the field, and just watch the explosiveness out of this break. Oof. Gives a two way go, and just makes that guy guess. I mean, the crossover was just. Filthy. Look at that. Boom. Explodes to the middle. Secures the ball. Here comes the hit. Get down. I mean, first down, move the chains, control the middle of the field. Absolutely. Third and five, roughly on this one, gets to the sticks, gets across, makes himself available, creates separation. I love the crossover point, especially after you just mentioned like the whole basketball mentality with different skill sets in your wide receiver room. Isabella crosses up the nickel here as if uh, he's like a point guard or a two guard, you know, attacking the paint and just crosses him up and attacks and drives. And you see the stutter, you see him with that hesitation. He breaks down this corner and puts him into the situation where he can go outside. He can go inside, breaks him down. You see the shimmy, the hesitation. And what I love is when he finally puts his foot in the ground, like you said, you just see that burst right out of it. He crosses up the corner and you see him separate instantly. And this isn't a play that has to go for, you know, 70 yards into the house or whatever. Like you're just trying to move the sticks, control the middle of the field, like you said. And if you can display this type of, ability here on this option route kind of look where you can break down a corner quickly and decisively and create instant separation and then make a pretty good, um, you know, off frame catch and get to the ground in a conversion. This is a very, very valuable commodity, whether it's for the bills who need that middle of the field controlling piece or any team really. Again, this is another high quality route. Doesn't matter if it's against second team, third team, whatever. This is a quality route from a dude who understood the situation and how to exploit a matchup given his alignment and given the play call. Right. And he knew, uh, you could see it's man coverage that that corner traveled with him. All right. And then you got the linebacker on the tight end and then this linebacker on the running back. So they know in this situation that it's probably man coverage. 
Will there be a, 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 a robber defender in the middle of the field? We don't know, but you do see that safety come down late, but that's where that's where you want to, you know, exploit this middle of the field. This guy is nowhere near there. So I really like that play from Isabella, really good crossover. And, you know, again, controlling the tempo, moving the ball, moving the chains. That's what you want to see from the slot uh, for in the Bills offense, especially mm-hmm. when Josh Allen's in there. It's something that he missed mightily last year, uh, yeah. you know, when it came to that. So the next player I want to highlight is Aitman. He's a guy I really liked when he was in college. Uh, mm-hmm. He's, again, had another, just like Isabella, has had a rough, rough go at it. But mm-hmm. We see some of the nuance to his game, and it's in this route running on this play. This is mesh. This is a very good man coverage beater concept. He is to the bottom of the screen right here, tight alignment. Usually that lets the defense know that there is running some type of you know shallow crossing route, and he gets it. But I want you to watch as he's coming across the field here. So there's a rat defender in the middle right there, and that guy is supposed to disrupt mm-hmm. any crossers. So you see this crosser go behind him. Watch Aitman attack him and then work in front of him so that the trail technique defender gets picked off from his own guy, and then he gets the the shallow crossing route reception and then, again, moves the chains. I like, again, it's very subtle. Mm -hmm. There's not much to this, but this is understanding the coverage, understanding how to work your defender in space, and getting open. This is part of getting open, and Aitman did a great job on this play. I don't even have really anything to add. That was the exact the exact big point takeaway. I think I think someone might see this and be like, oh, you know, he just runs across the middle on mesh and gets open. No, like he runs that corner, number 27 for the Colts. He purposefully runs this route at that angle, at that depth, to get 27 picked off by that linebacker sitting in the middle of the field. It it made me pop a little bit when I watched it on tape because you see him turn and then he dips that shoulder. He knows that 27 is on his ass right behind yep. him. So he leads him into the traffic to get him caught in the wash so he can separate and come out clean on the other end. And I love the point that you made. It's so subtle. Like this is one of those, you know, if you blink, you miss it type of things. This is a really quality, crafty play on just one of a quote unquote, you know, simpler type of concept or idea. This is a really well run route and it led to a big gain. Yeah, just good stuff. And again, this guy, the chances of him making the roster are very slim, but I want to show, you know, he's got to put on film for other teams in the league too. So this does go, you know, it, it does help him out in the long run. So we want to throw him a little kudos, you know, we want to, you know, another guy that we want to throw some kudos. He started off pretty rough, real rough. Yeah. (laughs) Tyrell shavers. Uh, this is his touchdown, but he's a guy that had what two drops before he got this touch with three total, but he had two, I think before. Yeah. Back to touchdown. Yeah. But again, you know, the mentality of being able to bounce back and it's, it's a minor thing. It's very subtle, but watch this out and up and how he sells it. Look how he looks into the boundary, and right? And then Aitman's, uh, again, Aitman's, that's a nice little rub. It's not a pick. It's a Goat, rub. Goatman. So he, yeah. <laughs> okay, now you have to apply that to every guy we break down now. The rest I kind of want to, yeah. <laughs> So you see, I, I called it a looky. He kind of looks to the boundary, sells it out and up, and then just gets upfield. A really easy, you know, pitch and catch for him. But, again, a little nuance to that. Um, really good blocking by the offensive line, too, and timing and throw by Barkley. But uh, Shavers, again, you know, started off rough, but he did pick it up towards the end of this game. When this ball was in the air and I saw who it was going to, I literally was like, dude, please don't drop this one. Like, you had <laughs> such a rough go. Just bring it down. And, you know, there, there there's some pieces to like with him, you know, the size and the frame, um, even the fluidity here after he gives that little looky like you labeled there, watch him just get up field with good acceleration. He separates very easily with that stride and that gait. And they went to him um, early and often. And, you know, again, it was unfortunate initially that he had those drops, but he came through with this touchdown and, and uh, some other nice moments as he went through, he had a nice uh, pass interference that he drew later in the fourth quarter with how he got downfield. Um, so nice to see him respond, right? You And that's a piece, too, you want to see in preseason. With some of these guys who are fighting for roster spots, when they fail, and they will, 
you want to see how they respond, right? Do they spiral and compound their mistakes with other mistakes or do they separate from that and rise above? And he did that. He started out a little rough early on, but then came through and really improved. So um, again, you know, good, a uh, good play there from him and shout out to him responding. And now we move on to Mr. I, I love this route, like mm-hmm. the separation on this from Keyshawn Johnson. It annoys me that his name is Keyshawn Johnson and it's not <laughs> Keyshawn Johnson. But besides that, this was really nice too. Yeah, and he's he's probably the guy. I know everyone has been talking about Isabella, but this is the guy I'm really rooting for right mm. here. And again, maybe it's not with the Bills, but I just really like his game and how he sells this route vertically up the field and then just sits. Yes. And then again, here's that window. As this flats defender gets out there, you see the pass go into that window and he just catches it with his hands and gets outfield. I really like how he sells this route vertically. Obviously sits down at the top of it too. Uh, but you can see as he's getting vertically, he's dude, his head's down. He's mm-hmm. pumping those arms. He's selling mm-hmm. a go off of play action, especially when you're talking a single high coverage. So he's getting that corner to drop deep, and then he's just sitting. That guy flies by, and you find that window. He finds the ball, and he moves the chains. Absolutely. Exactly. Like you said, sells the vertical, runs the corner off. And, you know, he's not the the biggest dude, you know, 6'1", 200 pounds roughly, but I like the way he sinks his hips at the mm-hmm. top of the route. And it doesn't take him, you know, five or six steps to come out of the vertical part of his stem and break down. And like you said, like he's cooking, like it's not like he's running at 50%, like he's running hard selling the vertical. So for him to go from kind of a top speed to be able to just drop those hips and bang, bang with three steps and pop out again, that's a quality route. And you see it reflected in the separation he creates like 37 gets run off and then falls down after he gets run off. And there's almost like a full circle radius, five, six yards around him. Um, that makes him available and open to Matt Barkley. This was a, a really nice piece from him. Again, he had a nice game too. And you add it with his size and frame. He's someone who I liked as well. This was a quality route and a quality win for him in a big way. Right. And, you know, we have some questions uh, about, uh, let's see, question for you boys. Who's the best special teams in our wide receiver group? That's the thing. Ooh. The thing with Johnson is I looked up just, just the reps, like how many different special teams reps the depth wide receivers had. And, if I remember correctly, Johnson isn't on special teams. That's what's going to mm. hurt him. But yeah. we said the same thing about Hodgins last year. Yep. So I don't know. Uh, he's a guy that doesn't play a lot of special teams, whereas a lot of the others do. Um, as mm-hmm. far as who's better, I mean, I, I, I think at this point it's kind of a toss-up, really. I, there's no one really that stands out. Obviously, Isabella is a guy that has experience, mm-hmm. you know, in the regular season playing special teams. Um, but – how you know how often we'd see him even if he does you know crack the squad or even mm-hmm. the practice squad who knows but shorter's the guy that i didn't really have film on he didn't he didn't, really, he, didn't t- he didn't see a he ton of snaps no yeah and he even when he was anything. on the field yeah there was no targets like there wasn't um and again, like granted, very, very small sample size, but a couple reps for shorter, like he kind of got out physical a bit and got jammed. Um, there were some times where he he did, you know, get open on a couple routes, but Kyle Allen didn't look his way. Um, and that's not necessarily a complete indictment on him for this first game, but I know I feel like it was good for us to mention that since so many people I think thought we'd see more from shorter, you know, from the depth receiver perspective. And here we come out of this game talking about Keyshawn Johnson and Andy Isabella and Aitman and even Patman and all, all these other guys and shorter was kind of kind of MIA on the field when it came to total snaps. And then obviously definitely uh target share and usage perspective. Cool. Yeah. And so let me bring up uh, some of the special team snaps. Uh, yes. If this works correctly. Oh, now you're going to go super small. Okay. Um, <laughs> Just you know, eight men. You. Yeah, it really is. Too. It's, there's like a delay on it. Um, come on now. These are one of the pieces too that like, again, we talk about the, the things that we have access to because of the support from you folks and our access to everything we have here at PFF, the ability to dive into these advanced metrics and be able to look at special team snaps and target shares and usage rates and route combinations and all these pieces. This is another example, um, as Eric brings it up here of 
one of the things that we're only able to do because of the support that you folks uh, lend to us and give to us here um, at Cover One. So one of the things that every time we log into it, we're very thankful for uh, the appreciation. Uh, yes, it's guys. being very, very fickle right now. So I'm just going to slowly, yeah, yeah. slowly scroll down. Right. Um, just look. I see. And that's just doing it. On its own. <laughs> Dude, it's, right. wild. it's that's right on its own. So. Yeah, we're going to scratch that. But Aitman is up there. I think he had seven snaps. Most of the mm -hmm. wide receivers, aside from Johnson, had seven, six snaps on special teams, various special teams. A group. lot of Isabella's came in a return capacity uh, for, for everyone just to kind of put that out there just to be right. safe versus right. being like a gunner or, you know, going down on spot on kick return coverage, which is something maybe that leans into the shorters and the Aitmans of the world. Right. No doubt about it. Which All is right. also a big well, piece too. Like, cause it's not even just like, Oh, do they play special teams? It's what kind of special teams role do they have? Like what capacity, like Isabella quote unquote plays special teams, but it's more of in returner capacity. I don't know if he's going to be that guy. That's going to be a gunner, be that guy covering down on kick coverage. That may be where you want, you know, eight men or shorter or potentially Keyshawn Johnson. So that's a, a, another special teams piece to track as well. Not just the total snaps, but how they're being used and what they're capable of. All right, Anthony, let's let's you know, close this segment out for the wide receivers. And this segment is brought to you by Nickel City Cigars, our light up play of the game this yes. touchdown. So why don't you talk about Nickel City Cigars and uh, where they're located and what they offer us as a sponsor? Very happy to welcome them back for another year of partnership with us here in the film room. They're located in downtown Buffalo, 284 Franklin Street. And we talked about it last year, just what we do here on this show, the kind of new age uh, way that we attack the content creation game and the film we break down and the niche we occupy, but the, the level at which we do it and the community that we adhere to and work towards, it's a similar piece with nickel city cigars. We like partnering with brands that operate in a, a similar space or, you know, business model that we have and just their new age twist on the cigar game and you know what they do. So, you know, they, they've got their, location but it's more of a new school boutique cigar experience they've got a modern lounge they've got vintage arcade games set up they've got several tvs like that's not a piece you think it's the the cigar game and it's really just everybody sitting around smoking some stogies like here you can smoke <laughs> some stogies and you're playing vintage arcade games and just it's a really new school twist on it they've also got bourbon they've got local uh 716 craft beers yeah. they've got a full members bar um you, they also have an online piece that we love where you can pick up in store or have your order shipped to your door. Um, use the promo code cover one that's covering the number one for 20% off of your entire order at nickel city cigars.com. Um, they're tremendous. We're happy to bring them back for a second year and, you know, their product also works for a really great sponsor segment with the light up play of the game. And this one okay. was uh, a really nice light up play for, for Mr. Patman. Again, just that that route nuance, right? Again, yeah. bottom of the depth chart type guys. And watch as he gets inside leverage, gets vertical, a little physicality at the top of this route. Sounds like he's going to hit the post. Obviously, you're not going to run a post into a post safety. And mm -hmm. you see him break out back wide. And that separation that he creates and the timing and the throw is just money. I really like the, the nuance to this route. And it's not something that maybe we've seen in past years. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like the floor of this wide receiver group has been elevated over the last couple of years. And again, maybe, maybe we're starting to see some of that, the fruits of the labor of wide receiver coach Henry. That's a great point. I, I, the, the floor piece with this group. And yeah, maybe it is the impact of Henry. Like you are again, it's going to be hard for these guys to crack the roster, whether it is, you know, whether it is Patman, whether it's Keyshawn Johnson, Isabella, Aitman, Shavers. But what's interesting is, yeah, you're seeing this level of nuance and craftiness from all these guys in one way or another. And, you know, Eric, this was one I hadn't completed the offensive film yet when you had watched it and you texted me already on it. You were like, yo, like the craftiness and nuance from Patman on that touchdown. And I remember seeing it on the broadcast, but the broadcast just makes it seem like, oh, it's a corner route touchdown. This was real pretty. Like you mentioned, like he gets on that inside shoulder of the corner and he sells that post with the lean and the head fake and the corner bites it and he loses him completely here. And then what I like too, as he turns, so number 30, that corner for the Colts, he bit on that inside piece right here because the head fake and the step. I like how he works through the contact 30 has his hands on him. He's trying to grab him. 
Patman shakes him, extends, is able to separate. And you can see, you know, his 30 is kind of left, like leaning over his feet a little bit. He was trying to grab on. He was trying to stop and reroute or just hold, grab, whatever verbiage you want to use. Patman there, Patman works through the contact, separates further. So you see the nuance at the top of the route. You see the physicality and the strength to be able to work through the contact and work through the hands. And seeing this from a guy who, I don't know, is eighth or ninth yeah. on the wide receiver depth chart. Like it's really cool to see this level of nuance and craftiness from guys that, you know, it's going to be hard for them to make the team, but it's to, to your point there, just a high floor when you've got guys that are double down on the depth chart at eight, nine or 10 operating with this level of craftiness and nuance. It makes the preseason games much more entertaining and it makes you confident in either the, scouting department or pro personnel group who identifies these guys and bring that brings them in or your wide receivers coach who is coaching these guys up either way it speaks to the organization and the development and also to these guys individually yeah and it speaks to our sponsor nickel city cigars once again light up play of the game that touchdown by patman again get to nickelcitycigars.com what their website for and and type in promo code cover one for 20 percent off your order hey Get downtown and, and jump into the store and, and check out the facility and use the, the cover one code and get 20% off there as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we're happy they are back with us in the film room each and every week this season. Again, we couldn't do it without all of you guys, all of our sponsors. So with that said, Anthony, that was a lot of offense. And we did was- we did uh you know burn a lot of time doing that. And we you know, we appreciate everyone tuning in right now, but we're not done. No, we're not done. We, we still have some defensive film. Like There's most a whole this, other side of the ball. Yeah, uh, you know, so I hope you guys uh, brought your beverages <laughs> um, and snacks. Uh, Debo was grabbing and he dusted them at the stem. Absolutely. At the top of that route, man, he broke off there. Really good stuff from Patman. But I want to switch to the defensive side of the ball, and we won't spend as much time on that side of the ball because there were a lot of good topics for the offensive side. But mm-hmm. let me ask you, what did you – what did you expect in this game? Again, preseason game, and, and maybe what uh, what were you excited to see or happy to see from the defense and Sean McDermott's debut as the defensive play caller, but yes. still head coach? Yeah, um, some of the, you know, we, we, we've continued to talk about it since the loss of the Bengals and what we would like to see more from with this defense in terms of schematic pieces and tweaks and things in terms of tendency and a lot of that coincided with what Sean McDermott has been in Carolina and at Philly. And when he was announced the play caller for this defense, it got us very excited. We talked about it a ton throughout this off season. And I think we started to see some of these pieces. We started to see some, you know, stunts up front, some run blitzes a little bit. Granted, again, this is tying into the vanilla pieces on that side of the ball, but some more man coverage here, some more cover one, um, no pun intended there, but seeing, seeing some of those schematic pieces and the tweaks in a, in a pure Sean McDermott defense versus a Leslie Frazier with Sean McDermott overseeing type of defense. We're starting to, we, we saw it in training camp. We saw it at the scrimmage. We're starting to see it continue in the real game. So continuing to follow those breadcrumbs got me excited. Um, I also like the performance from the depth guys on the interior defensive line. Tim Settle had some nice plays that popped. Puna Ford had a couple nice reps. I continue to really love Ilianku. You know, I know he's a practice yeah. squad guy and a big depth guy, but he had some really, really, really strong run defense reps in this game. Kind of similar to what he did last year yeah. when he had to fill in when the defensive line um, was just hit with the plague early on in the year. Um, and then another piece as well that, I, I wanted to shout out because it's not being talked about a ton. Greg Rousseau had some really strong pass rush reps. Again, it was against a rookie in, in Blake Freeland um, for the Colts, but he had him off kilter. He lifted him off the ground on an inside move at one point. So I was happy with the defensive line performance of several guys. And then some of the breadcrumbs were continuing to attach to what a Sean McDermott Buffalo Bills defense looks like. Yeah, and that defense looked very aggressive in my opinion. It was very aggressive. They ran – Several run blitzes right off the bat. Rousseau just, you know, slants inside. They bring a guy off the edge. We saw those run blitzes. Um, we saw some five-man pressures that created mm-hmm. issues. 
Um, the, the, Dane Jackson, of- the Dane Jackson interception is because Saran Neal um, yeah, blitzed right. off that slot. And Dane Jackson is the corner that everyone loves and wants to be corner to. All Bills fans agree that he's their guy and he doesn't cause any problems whatsoever. Yeah, seriously. But then, yeah, my big takeaway, like you, was that defensive line. We're going to break down Tim Settle's game. We're going to break down um, Puna Ford. Uh, yes. He looked really stout. You mentioned mm-hmm. Eli Anku. Um, I, I thought the D line, especially the interior D line, everyone's talking about, oh, how, you know, how are we going to get by with Dodson? Bernard's hurt. Mm-hmm. Dorian Williams should get a shot, which I agree. Dorian Williams should get a shot. He's probably not going to at Mike linebacker. I think yeah. we need to really just uh, understand that and comprehend that now. But I don't think it will matter much if the Bills get the reinforcements mm-hmm. and play mm-hmm. from the interior defensive line that we are expecting and that we saw the first quarter, the first six games of last year, when you can roll guys like Daquan Jones, Ed Oliver, Puna Ford. uh, I mean, just so many different guys, Tim settle, Jordan Phillips didn't even play. Yeah. Like when you can roll those guys at interior defensive line, it kind of minimizes or or kind of makes things a little easier Mm -hmm. for Tyrell Dodson or whoever Mm -hmm. is going to be the starter at, at middle linebacker. So I know a lot of, People want to talk about Dodson and the Mike linebacker, which aside from a couple missed tackles, one, he got picked off. Dodson got picked off by Matt Milano in the hole. Mm. He had two missed tackles. I think that was really why a lot of people are mad at his game. I don't think he played awful. I think those missed tackles, there's some context to it, but I don't care (laughs) if the defensive tackle position can roll those guys in waves. Like we're expecting and play to the level that they have in the past, man, it doesn't matter what's happening at the second level, Anthony. They were that good uh, against the Colts on Saturday. Absolutely. We, we, we've we talked about it so much on this show from not just from a Bills perspective, but just football in general. If if you're going to play with these light boxes and these two high safety shells and structures and coverages, your defensive line has to do work. And I think that gets lost a lot. And, you know, I'll use Fred Warner as an example. You know, Fred Warner is a tremendous linebacker, one of the best, if not the best off ball linebackers in football. But what gets lost all the time is, the Velociraptors that the 49ers have up front. It's not just Bosa. Like they just rotate a group that win and cause havoc up front, which allows Fred Warner to take advantage of his athleticism and those pieces that he has to his game. And what's nice is if you pair a quality rotation from an individual skill set perspective with some of these run stunts and some of this more aggressive nature, it adds up to freeing up your linebackers to make plays and making their job easier. So Exactly your point. It's a nice balance. Like Dodson or whoever is going to start this year is not Tremaine Edmonds from a skill set standpoint. But if this defensive line hits on the cylinders, we think they can. You can mitigate that loss or any potential skill set deficiency because of how good you can be up front consistently. Yeah, and and settle. You know, when we're talking about being good up, up front, and he was super in this game. And yes, it's funny because you know, leading into this game, I was told that. Settle's injury last year, injuries were a lot worse than many people knew about. And it would make sense because in this game, he was disruptive as a pass rusher. He was dropping to, you know, he's dropping his near knee to take mm-hmm. on double teams. Like he looked like a different player. And he's a guy that we talked about in the playoffs last year that kind of just disappeared. So mm-hmm. you get a little more of that context and a little more of that information. Uh, from last year and how things went for him and to see him do some of the stuff he did in this game that's the type of stuff that the bills wanted from him last year and this is another one of those plays where you got to see that power uh, versus a really good center in kelly there and you can see him just push him back right to the quarterback spot and just envelop the quarterback on that play anthony and this is again like the this is nice for settle in a vacuum but the larger picture is you know, Tim Settle is, if all things go to plan, is probably your defensive tackle at best three, but probably like mm-hmm. four or five, somewhere in that rotation. And if you can get this level of effectiveness and quality from him. And I'm sorry, that wasn't against Kelly. Let me, that I won't yes. go that far. I don't think that was against Kelly. That but was, but he had a couple reps. Yeah, this, this one wasn't, right. but he had a couple good reps earlier. Um, and I think that was some of the encouraging things we saw too. Like when Kelly was in there, when Quentin Nelson was in there, mm-hmm. we saw the effectiveness for the interior of the Bills defensive line. And yes, yeah, that'll look good. Like you watch him attack that outside shoulder initially and then just refits 
drives through his man. He goes for the rip, isn't going to get it. And then watch him take that right arm and gets it underneath. And he torques, yep, and lifts his man almost kind of like he tries to go for a hump move, but instead that just kind of yeah. torques him. Yeah, and like lifts the inside. He gets the inside body, the leg, the shoulder, all of it up and out of the way from that center, drives through his man, and then brings the quarterback down as that center is trying to take him. This is a forceful play. This is an athletic play, smooth, like it's chaos creation on the interior, and it was nice to see him finish this off. Again, as a depth guy, that's very encouraging to see for this defense. Right. And uh, on, I think it was like the very next play. He helps uh, Basham get the sack here. See him just outside the guard. And then cool. just that is something we didn't Andre, see last year. That level of that burst and shake and, and jump from like on the snap. He just look how look how nimble and quick the feet are. Like that's literally that's basketball point guard stuff. Not even to like embellish it. Like that's impressive for a dude that shouldn't be that athletic. Right, and and what's interesting about this play is not just him winning there, but it's how the Bills set it up. Puna Ford right down Broadway, right down the middle of this center. So Settle and Basham know they're essentially working to the man side of the protection. So yep. Settle essentially has a two-way go here. Obviously, with the way the offensive lineman set out wide and overset, he took the inside lane, the quickest lane to the quarterback, and it was, it was a good move from him. Quarterback does elude him, but again, he helped Basham get the sack there. That is... That explosiveness from this three tech position with Ford at nose tackle, like this is what the Bills wanted from him last year, and it's good to see that he's you know rounding back into form. Uh, you know when it when it talk when we talk about that contract that Bean gave him, so yeah, this is encouraging. We talk about encouraging things from this game. This was encouraging to see from Tim Settle. He gets he he's right down Broadway, pressure on the quarterback in under two seconds, which is an absolute death sentence most of the time for an offense and for any quarterback and he wins decisively he wins cleanly I love the footwork I love the quick arm over slash swim move you know whatever verbiage you want to use however you categorize it it's quick it's succinct it's tight it's athletic like it again just really impressive completely disrupts this play and allows Basham, um, you know, some help there to kind of clean it up. And even, you know, kudos to Basham on this one. I like the hand swipe um, I, and his ability mm -hmm. to get around the arc on Freeland, who uh, struggled a bit. You know, Rousseau ate him up early on, but Terrible. good on Basham. Yeah, good, good on so Basham. So bad. No, it was not, not great. Just, no. Especially from a dude who, like, his calling card, you know, for Freeland was kind of more of that athleticism Athletic. piece. <laughs> and yes, and he just, as soon as Basham swipes the hands there, he's done he swipes him yeah. there boom and then he goes to swipe to grab again and bash him just like swats his right mm -hmm. hand away like get the hell off me flattens beats him around the arc so a rough rep for freeland um good on basham but again settle is the highlight just with the immediate disruption on the interior and awesome point by you with aligning forward over the center those are that you could that's how you can kind of dictate your matchups versus the protection with what you're going to see and if you've got guys that you're confident that can win one-on-one -on -one, like von miller or rousseau or floyd or daquan or ed oliver you can dictate those matchups and if you've got the horses to do it that's a huge piece for sean mcdermott when he uses those calls now great segue you had ford as the nose tackle on that play this time he's more of that three tech it's a little tighter to the guard here but they have eli anku as the nose tackle here and i want you to just watch how ford and anku control the line of scrimmage Oof. look at how it allows the bills to maintain the line of scrimmage and everyone else can gap out and close down the running lane here i mean ford and anku on this play were just rocks and they did not let anyone get by there and you can see Dodson is pretty easy job. Guess what? I'm going to, the ball's <laughs> funneled right to him. This is what yeah. I'm saying. And we're, especially if we're talking about the run and, and how big of a loss it was to lose Daquan Jones in that game against the Bengals. Yeah. It's, it's having guys like this as depth players that we could throw on the field and move them around. You saw Ford play nose tackle. You saw Ford play mm -hmm. three tech. And in, and in the end, when teams want to go to these, you know, multiple tight end sets and run downhill and you, you know, you have to stop them. Guess what? The bills have the guys up front that can control the line of scrimmage. They're not just playing that light nickel look, yes. you know, with those lighter defensive linemen getting blown off the ball. They have real dudes now in yes. the trenches. And you see that on this play. This is something we we've been clamoring for, for, 
multiple off seasons and we felt better about it last year when they added Daquan Jones, we wanted that more physical presence on the interior because of the prevalence of their, the bills usage of nickel and light boxes and all that stuff. And what's also nice about this one, this one now is the starting unit for the Colts. So you've got a really good center in Ryan Kelly. You've got one of the best guards and offensive linemen in all of football and Quentin Nelson and Puna Ford is against Quentin Nelson mm. there. You see him get underneath Nelson, gets that leverage, drops the knee, gives no ground, right? Does not get displaced, stays on the offensive line. Look at the lean for that big, like, mass of humanity. Drops. Watch the pads of Nelson and his yes. helmet snap back. <laughs> There's the, so you see, not only do you see the leverage and the lean, but that means there's some pop and some force in what Puna Ford's doing. Gums up the works on the interior, drops that knee, stays strong at the point of attack. Then you've got Ilianku, who they tried a double team and hit with that feed block. And look how he did this multiple times in the game. Yep. He gets knocked off kilter, but he's able to just anchor down on that right leg and he doesn't get moved out of the way. Well, we he split it. Yes, he, he he split it. He got inside that inside uh, offensive lineman. So beautiful, like that level of strength and physicality that that takes upper body strength, lower body strength, core strength. Like that takes a lot to be able to withstand that. And again, stay strong at the point of attack, a point of attack like Puna Ford. And when you've got two defensive tackles that just completely gum up the works and hold strong at the line and allow for no displacement, that's how you get you know. There's an alley there. Saran Neal comes and fills it. Yeah. That's a good piece. You've got Dodson sitting there. Like that's how you gap out, cover all your bases. And even if you're not gapped out with a, from a numbers perspective, being able to cause this type of muddiness against an offensive line, that's how you ruin their numbers advantage because you just gum up the works completely. You make them have to play slow and you allow your guys to go and make a play. All right, guys, last play of this breakdown. Uh, we're not going to be able to get to the Williams film, but if you're looking for the Williams breakdown, get to the Cover One YouTube channel after this show. I did a complete breakdown on him and his play, strengths, weaknesses, things to look at going forward. All right, Puna Ford. Now we get to see him at nose tackle and some of that knockback oh. on, again, the starting center for the Colts. And again, we talked about those light boxes, Anthony. Light Just box one here. One. Yeah, six, six in the box. And Ford is making this play. He's making this play so easy. And just how he controls the offensive lineman, controls the line of scrimmage, scrapes down the line of scrimmage with good <laughs> footwork, and then just swallows the running back there. Just, I can't wait to watch this dude play on Sundays in the regular season. Tremendous individual effort, tremendous individual performance. Again, as a dude who's probably third or fourth string, you know, depending on, on right. the week against again a starting center and a good starting center in Ryan Kelly. I I love how he gets underneath Kelly initially. You see the pop. You see him not only drive Kelly back from, you know, a an overall like yardage standpoint, but he he wrenches him back. He gets those look at the hand placement. It's in Control, that man. yes, it's in that collarbone numbers area. He gets him, he grabs him, he wrenches him back. And once he wrenches him back, then he establishes control. I love this. Look at him with that. He's just basically using like a it's long arm there. Yeah, yeah. Two gapping, controlling Ryan Kelly, reads the play. He's got his eyes on the running back right there as he's got two hands on Kelly. He sees the track of the running back and says, oh, okay, you're going to my left. Cool. <laughs> Let me get my head and shoulder into that gap, extend and keep my outside half free by controlling with my inside arm, gets his body in the gap and basically makes this entire play by himself. And exactly like you said, this is what you need when you're going to use light boxes and you're going to play with too high shells and too high coverage structures, this is the type of play you need on the interior. You need your guys to win one-on-one -on -one matchups and steal gaps and cause havoc. And when an offense has the advantage, you need them to make a play and either muddy the waters for your second and third level defenders to come make a play or get them to make a play themselves. And, Puna Ford basically owns this entire rep by himself. Mm -hmm. He jacks up and knocks back a very good center in the NFL, clogs the lane, yeah. makes the tackle. Like, this is all him. It's it's just a real, real quality rep and really encouraging given where he you know, potentially sits on the depth chart and what it speaks to this group for the Bills. Yeah, that's a play that reminds me of the film room with Daquan Jones where he initially got reached but then he retraced over the top and strung the play out. It's exactly Cleveland. like that to the same side against Cleveland. Yeah. 
And, you know, I saw a lot of comments when we posted this on social media about Dodson's angle. Dodson's playing it perfectly. He's playing off of Mm -hmm. Ford and he obviously goes outside. So he takes the backside Mm -hmm. gap there. So again, if the D tackles play like we expect, man, Dodson is going to, again, he's going to have a lot of things catering to right to him. It's going to come right down Broadway, right at him. And there's going to be a lot of easy cleanup tackles and he's going to be clean. He's going to be clean a lot more than Edmonds ever was. I think in, in priors, I think the depth at interior defensive line is some of the best we've seen it in this regime. Mm -hmm. And I think the guys at the second level are going to definitely benefit from that. Oh, absolutely. Like if you can get that and, and think about even on like that last play with Puna Ford, like they're trying to run this to, you know, between the garden tackle there and on that outside piece. And so if, your defensive lineman can get out in front of that. They funnel that run back inside to where the linebackers already are. And so if you're Dotson, if you're Milano, that makes your job easier. Instead of having to go from, you know, the A gap to the B or the C, you kind of just mm-hmm. stay in the A gap and play it and then make the tackle. That level of play and execution up front is going to be huge for this defense. You still, despite the tweaks we want to see, right, from a coverage usage standpoint and a front standpoint, despite what we want to see schematically for this Bills defense, the core of it, you still want to see some similarities. Like you still want to see those two high looks to limit explosive. You still want to see that light box and nickel play, like given what defenses or what offenses are built to do nowadays, but you need to have that in tandem with this kind of defensive line play. And very encouraging that we've seen it throughout camp and the scrimmage. Very encouraging that we saw it in week one of the preseason from the depth guys against starting a starting unit for the Indianapolis Colts. Yep. I'm, I'm very excited again, small sample size, but it's nice to see these guys rolling already in this regard. And I think it speaks to what we're going to see from them from a schematic and identity standpoint this year from the bottom guys all the way to the top. Right. And uh, again, guys, thanks for joining us. I know we went a little long, but we appreciate everyone tuning in uh, to that breakdown, smash that like button, leave us a comment and subscribe to the cover on the YouTube channel. Again, if you didn't get to see some of the film, on Dorian Williams. It was pretty impressive and encouraging. Uh, get to the Cover One YouTube channel. Uh, we're gonna, uh, we have a, a video there that I did the other day. And then, of course, at 9.30 tonight, Cover One Buffalo with Greg and Aaron being back in the fold. Uh, they'll be going live at 9.30, not at 9 o'clock. So, again, thank you for joining us yes. and breaking down this film, uh, this film session with us. Absolutely. And if there are any, you know, questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, player pieces we didn't touch on, plays you had a question about, get at us on Twitter, um, you know, at cover one, you can get at me at pro underscore underscore ant. Um, I, you know, honestly, I'm, I'm, I don't want to overstate it, but if you have a question, you can probably just search our Twitter handles right now. And there's a good chance we already posted that clip with some analysis <laughs> yeah. and breakdown pieces. Um, but regardless, question, thoughts, comments, concerns, get at us on Twitter or leave a comment on this episode on YouTube. We'll circle back, answer those there, provide anything and everything we can. Like Eric said, major thank you to all you folks who joined us live on this show. Um, if you're still here now, please, please, please. And thank you. Drop a like on this video. If you are watching later, please drop a like on this video as well. If you are listening on one of the podcasting apps or platforms, that's awesome too. Please rate and review and subscribe to uh, the Cover One Film Room on whatever podcasting app or platform you are listening to this show on. Um, oh, that's awesome, Rick. Thank you very much for the kind words. See a lot of other kind words coming through in the chat yeah, as well. Thanks, we appreciate guys. you folks. That's awesome. It, it sincerely means um, a ton to us. Please subscribe to the Cover One Film Room here on YouTube and to Cover One as a whole. We have you covered every single day of the week uh, for the Buffalo Bills and various pieces for the NFL. Um, so we got you covered a ton. Thank you very much to our sponsors for this season. We are it's preseason, but we're in in season form. Eric is highlighting them at the bottom there. You know, <laughs> year two for Nickel City Cigars, and then year one for Easy Loan Auto Sales, and then our boy Jonathan Miller from Metro Roberts Realty. Thank you very much for. Um, you know, joining us this year on this journey. And Let's go. I know we're pumped for you guys to be aboard <laughs> and we're pumped for the show. We're pumped for the bills. Football is back, man. Eric, any parting words for the people before we get out of here? No, great show guys. Thanks for all the engagement, all the kind words. We'll see you next week in the film room.
Absolutely. You, will, you can find us next week, live Wednesday, August 23rd, 7 p.m. Eastern, as we break down the Bills and Steelers game tape um, after this upcoming week in the preseason. Um, join me this Saturday live immediately following Bills right. versus Steelers for a special post-game edition of Disguise Coverage. So questions, thoughts, comments, concerns, emotions, anything and everything you got, join me live here um, on Disguise Coverage on the Cover One YouTube channel for that live post-game after Bills Steelers. We will see you here next week, Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, for another episode of The Film Room. Thank you to all you folks for tuning in. Thank you to our sponsors. Thank you, Eric, to you. Thank you to myself. Thank you to my wife for making this coffee and helping me get through this episode. I appreciate her. Shout out to all you folks. Tell your family and friends and loved ones about how awesome this show is. Word of mouth is greatly appreciated. We hope you and your family and friends and loved ones are all doing well and staying safe. Be kind to one another. Take care of one another. We will see you next Wednesday for another episode of the Cover One Film Room. Hopefully I see you this Saturday live after Bill Steelers for a post-game edition of Disguise Coverage. And for myself, Anthony Prohaska, for Eric Turner, this has been another episode of the Cover One Film Room. Football is back. We'll see you next week. Godspeed, and as always, go Bills.